Welcome to Dan's reading chapter three, The Lazy Controller. Congratulations, you made it to the next video. Get ready to listen to a terrible reader for, I don't know, like 30, 40 minutes. Okay, The Lazy Controller. I spend a few months each year in Berkeley, and one of my great pleasures there is daily four mile walk on a marked path in the hills with a fine view of San Francisco Bay. I usually keep track of my time and have learnt in a fair amount about effort from doing so. I have found a speed about 17 minutes for a mile which I experience as a stroll. I certainly exert physical effort and burn more calories at the speed than if I sat in a recliner, but I experience no strain, no conflict and no need to push myself. That's like Arnold Schwarzenegger. But I experience no strain, no conflict and no need to push myself. Um, um, that's a terrible. I can do that again. But I experience no strain, no conflict, and no need to push myself. You see, I, I can't do the Arnold thing. I need to push myself a little bit. Arnold, Arnold, and then, ah, there we go. Ah, but I experience myself. Oh, but I experience no strain, no conflict, and no need to push myself. Ah, it's terrible. I'll get into it later. I'm most able to think and work while walking at that rate. Indeed, I suspect that the mild physical arousal of the walk may spill over into greater mental alertness. System 2 also has a natural speed. You expend some mental energy in random thoughts and in monitoring what goes on around you, even when your mind does nothing in a particular, but there is a little strain. Unless you are in a situation that makes you unusually wary of or self-conscious, Monitoring what happens in the environment or inside your head demands little effort. You make many small decisions. Yeah. You make many small decisions as you drive your car, absorb some information as you read the newspaper, and conduct routine exchanges of pleasantries with a spouse or a colleague, or with little effort and no strain, just like a stroll. It is normally easily. You know, it's normally easily. You see, that's that's that two system. That's system one and system two. It's not working properly. It is normally easily, yeah, there it is again, it's, it is normally easy and actually quite pleasant to walk and think at the same time. But at the extremes, these activities appear to compete for the limited resources of System 2. You can confirm this claim by a simple experiment. While walking comfortably with a friend, ask him to compute 23 times 78 in his head and to do so immediately. Okay, I'm going to do this. 23 times 78, let's do this, 3 times 8. I have no idea, I forgot my math. Oh, and I'm a finance major, shame on you, you idiot. I think one of like three times eight, uh, three times seven, 21, so 24, uh, seven times three, that's 210, 234, um, and then what else? Then it's 234 plus, 160 and 160 oh fuck dude uh, do you see what this is like i'm thinking too much Jeez, hold on, i'm gonna do this wait for it give me a sec all right here we go so eight times three 24 then we go seven t times three which is um 210 210 plus 24 is 234. 234. 234 plus, can't remember that, 234, 234, 234. Again, okay, then 90 plus 8 times 2, 8 times 20, which is 160. So 160 plus 234, that's 100. 160 plus 234, so 100 plus. Jesus, Mary Christ, 160 plus 234. Jesus Christ, 160 plus 234. What's wrong with you? What's wrong? Don't you know 160 plus 234? It's hard. Don't judge me. 160 plus 234. So 200. That is 360. Yeah. Plus 34, that's 394. Okay, 394 plus 20 times 70. And I'm thinking that would be what? 
1,400. 394 plus 1,400. 394 plus 1,400 is 1,794. We did it, guys. Someone put some amazing... Okay, I did it. He almost he certainly stopped in his tracks. Yep, yeah, we did. We did. We just sat down. My experience is that I can think while struggling but cannot engage in mental work that imposes a heavy load on short-term memory. If I must construct an intricate argument under the time... Actually, let's just see. I just want to make sure that I calculated that properly. We're going through the video with like a dumbass. So we got... What is it? Oh, that's did I say 1,794? Yeah, I did. I did that with my brain. I'm so proud of it. And, uh, my experience is that I can think while struggling but cannot engage in mental work that imposes a heavy load on a short-term memory. If I must construct an intricate argument under time pressure, I would rather be still. And I would prefer to stick to what you're standing. Of course... Not all slow thinking requires a form of intense concentration and effortful computation. I did the best thinking of my life on leisurely walks with Amos. Accelerating beyond my strolling speed completely changes the experience of walking because the transition to a faster walk brings about sharp deterioration because no, no, a sharp deterioration in my ability to think coherently, coherently, or as Arnold would say, coherently, as a speed up. <laughs> My attention is drawn with increasing frequency to experience of walking and to deliberate and to the deliberate maintenance of the faster pace. My ability to bring a train of thought to a conclusion is impaired accordingly. At the highest speed I can sustain on the hills, about 14 minutes for a mile. I don't I did not even train. I did not even try. It's coming through me. <clears throat> That's not how it talks. I do not even try to think of anything else. In addition to the physical effort of moving my body rapidly along the path, the mental effort of self-control is needed to resist the urge to slow down. So in addition to the physical effort of moving my body rapidly along the path, in the addition to the physical effort moving my in addition to the physical effort, in addition to the physical effort of moving my body. In addition. To physical, you see, this is what happens when I don't want to read. In addition to the physical effort of moving my body rapidly along the path, a mental effort of self control is needed to resist the urge of a slowdown. So that's the system two trying to resist the urge of system one. <clears throat> self control and deliberate thought apparently draw on the same limited budget of effort. For most of us, most of the time, the maintenance of coherent train of thought. And the occasional engagement in effortful thinking also requires self-control. Although I have not conducted a systematic survey, I suspect that the frequent switching of tasks and speed up mental work are not intrinsically pleasurable, and the people avoid them when the when possible. Hopefully, you don't hear the music. Blah 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 blah. Alexa, can you go away? <laughs> go, music. Go. Whatever. Just keep going. For most of us, uh, blah, 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 blah. For most of us, the time, oh God, I've lost my freaking thought, damn it. And to deliberate maintenance of faster pace. My ability to bring a train of thought to a conclusion. Da, da, da. So, yeah, okay, apparently. Da. For most of us, most of the time, maintenance of current train of thought and the occasional game engine effort for thinking also requires self control. Although I have not conducted a systematic survey, I suspect that the frequent switching of tasks and speed up mental work are not intrinsically pleasurable and that people avoid them when possible. This is how the law of least effort comes to be law comes to be a law. Even the absence of time pressure maintaining a coherent train of thought requires discipline. An observer of the number of times I look at email or investigate the refrigerator during an hour of writing could reasonably infer an urge to escape and conclude that keeping at it requires more some control than I can readily master. Can you close the door? 
Nothing. Just close the door. You're in the bathroom, dude. Sorry. I lost my train of thought again. Just give me a second. I suspect the frequent switching of tasks can speed up mental work are not intrinsically, intrinsically pleasurable and that people avoid them when possible. This is how the law of least effort comes to be a law. Even in the absence of time, pressure maintaining a current train of thought requires discipline. An observer of the number of times I look at email or investigate the refrigerator during an hour of writing could reasonably infer an urge to escape and conclude that keeping at it requires more self-control than I can really master. Fortunately, cognitive work is not always aversive and people sometimes expend considerable effort for long periods of time without having to exert willpower. The psychologist Mihaly, oh my dear God, pronounced six, oh, this thing, did you see this? Mihaly, Mihaly, I can't even say it, man. Mihaly, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. If I know I'm butchering it. I apologize, but it says pronounced the psychologist Mihaly Six Cent Mihaly. So his name is Mihaly Six Cent. Oh my God, that's so hard. Mihaly Six Cent Mihaly. Mihaly. <laughs> these, these, this is the days, man. These are the days. Mihaly Six Cent Mihaly. Mihaly Six Cent. Mishan Mihaly. It's like saying that for Mihaly Six Cent Mihaly. No. Has done more, okay, I was just gonna say, Mihaly Sixcent Mihaly has done more than anyone else to study the state of effortless attending. Now, the name he proposed for it, flow, has become of, flow has become part of the language. People who experience flow describe it as a state of effortless concentration, so deep that they lose their sense of time of themselves, of their problems, and the descriptions of joy of the state are so compelling that Sixcent Mihaly has called it an optimal experience. Fuck, I said it correctly, baby. Many activities can induce a sense of flow from painting to racing motorcycles. And for some fortune authors, I know even writing a book is often optimal, often an, an optimal experience. Flow neatly separates the two forms of effort, concentration, one task and deliberate control of attention. Riding a motorcycle at 150 miles an hour and playing a competitive game of chess are certainly very effortful in a state of flow. However, maintaining focused attention on, those, on these absorbing activities require no exertion of self-control, thereby freeing resources to be directed to the task at hand. Imagine that. You're riding a motorcycle and you're like, checkmate, you know, like, <laughs> what the fuck? How would you even do that? Like, could you do maths on a motorcycle? I don't think so. You got to sit still and just concentrate. Like, mm -hmm. imagine the motorcycle. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, uh, bishop to e4 uh, <laughs> uh, queen to a3 whatever i don't know it can go anywhere anyway i don't know chess i mean i play chess but i'm not a professional chess player the next thing the busy and depleted system too oh yeah my system too is fucking busy uh it is now a well-established proposition that both self-control and cognitive effort are forms of mental work. Several psychological studies have shown that people who are simultaneously challenged by a demanding cognitive task and by a temptation are more likely to yield to the temptation. Imagine that you're asked to retain a list of seven digits for a minute or two. You're told that remembering digits is your top priority. While your attention is focused on digits, you're offered a choice between two desserts, a sinful chocolate cake and a virtuous fruit salad. The evidence suggests that you would be more likely to select the tempting chocolate cake. Yeah, fuck yeah, I would eat that chocolate cake. When your mind is loaded with digits. So if I'm thinking of a number 1000, I want to be like, give me that chocolate. Mm. System 1 has more influence on behavior when System 2 is busy. And it has a sweet tooth. Ooh. Well, obviously, because it needs dopamine, right? Sugar, like, enters your fucking body. And then... You're like, oh, I need more motivation to keep this resource in my head. Dopamine comes in, you keep it, more effort, more energy. I mean, that's like obvious. People who are cognitively busy are also more likely to make selfish choices, use sexist language, and make superficial judgment in social. Whoa, 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 slow down there. People who are cognitively busy are also more likely to make selfish choices, use sexist language, and make superficial judgments in social situations. So if you're cognitively busy, interesting. Memorizing and repeating digits loosens the hold of system two 
on behavior but of course cognitive load is not only cause of weak of cause of weakening weakened self-control a few drinks have the same effect as does a sleepless night the self-control of morning people is impaired at night the self-control of morning people is impaired at night the reverse is true of night people too much concern about how well one is doing in tasks sometimes disrupts performance by loading short-term memory with pointless anxious thoughts the conclusion is straightforward. Self-control requires attention and effort. Another way of saying this is that controlling thoughts and behaviors is one of the tasks that System Two performs. A series of s another way of saying this is that controlling thoughts and behaviors is one of the tasks that System Two performs. Controlling thought. Okay, yeah, two, yeah, that all the time. You know that scene. There's like a thing with Jim Carrey. It's like. I should jump. <laughs> no. uh, and you look at the should I, you know, you have those impending thoughts, but you never do them because those are just impulsive thoughts. They're not really, you know, you're not supposed to do them unless, you know, it's attached to your survival. And then, you know, whatever comes, becomes the most important. That's what you, you, you focus on the most, obviously. And your body's like that way or this way or whatever. Maybe I'm saying sounding ridiculous, but that's not the point. A series of the point is you're just listening to <laughs> and saying stupid shit. A series of surprising experiments by the psychologist Roy Baumeister and his colleagues has shown conclusively that all variants of voluntary effort, cognitive, emotional, or physical, draw at least partly on a shared pool of mental energy. The experience involves successive rather than simultaneous tasks. Baumeister's group has re has repeatedly found that an effort of will or self control is tiring. If you have had to force yourself to do something, you're less willing or less able to exert self-control when the next challenge comes around. The phenomenon has been named ego depletion. Ooh, fancy word. In a typical demonstration, participants who are instructed to stifle their emotional reaction to an emotionally charged film will later perform poorly in a test of physical stamina. Whoa, that's trippy. How long they can maintain a strong grip on a dynamic dyno, dyno, Dynamometer, 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 dynamometer. Another word. Dun, 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 dun. On a dynamometer, a dynamometer. Damn it, man! In spite of increasing discomfort, the emotional effort in the first phase of the experiment reduces. The emotional effort in the first phase of the experiment reduces the ability to withstand the pain of sustained muscle contraction and ego depleted people. Therefore, succumb more quickly to the urge to quit. Whoa. In another experiment, people are first depleted by a task in which they eat virtuous foods such as radishes and celery while resisting the temptation to indulge in chocolate and rich cookies. Because <laughs> you were <laughs> celery and it's like a cup being right there. <laughs> Broccoli. Like it's. Later, these people will give up earlier than normal when faced with a difficult cognitive task. The list of situations and tasks that are now known to deplete self-control is long and varied. All involve conflict and the need to suppress a natural tendency. They include avoiding the thought of white bears, inhibiting the emotional response to a stirring film, making a series of choices that involve conflict, trying to impress others. Respond, uh, and to, sorry, let me repeat this slowly. Making a series of choices that in involve conflict, trying to impress others, responding kindly to a partner's bad behavior. Ooh, could you imagine? Was like, like she said, you're an asshole. You're like, you're the prettiest girl in the world. But inside, you're like, you stupid bitch. I wish your mom killed you when you were young. <laughs> uh, the Daryl down here. Uh, what else? Uh, trying to press others, responding kind, uh, responding kindly to what's bad behavior, interacting with a person of different race for pre just ind individuals. The list of indications of depletion is also highly diverse. Deviating from one's diet, overspending on impulsive purchases, reacting aggressively to provocation, persisting less time in a hand grip task, performing poorly in cognitive tasks and logical decision making. So this, this that was the list of indications of depletion. Is obviously a high, highly diverse. So uh, the evidence is persuasive. Activities that impose high demands on system two require self-control, and the exertion of self-control is depleting and unpleasant. Unlike cognitive load, ego depletion is at least part of uh, part A loss of a, of motivation. After exerting self-control in one task, you do not feel like making an effort in another. Although you could do it if you really had to, in the several experience, people were able to resist the effects of ego depletion when given a strong incentive to do so. 
In contrast, increasing effort is not an option. In contrast, increasing effort is not an option when you must keep six digits in short-term memory while performing a task. Ego depletion is not the same mental state as a co cognitive busyness. The most surprising discovery made by Baumeister's group show as he puts it, sorry, as group shows as he puts it, that the idea of mental energy is more than a mere metaphor. The nervous system consumes more glucose than most other parts of the body. An effortful mental activity appears to be especially expensive in the currency of glucose. Ooh. When you are actively involved in a different cognitive reasoning or engaged in the task that requires self-control, your blood glucose levels drops. The effect is an analog analogous 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 analogous. I'm gonna analog. I'm gonna freaking stack another freaking word. Uh, where was I now? Da, 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 me a metaphor. The nervous system consumes more glucose than most other parts of the body. Um, and effortful mental activity appears to be especially expensive in the currency of glucose. When you are actively involved in difficult cognitive reasoning or engaged in tasks that require self-control, your blood glucose level drops. The effect of the effect is analogous, analogous, analogous. I, I don't know how to say the word. I'm just going to say. It. Analogous to a runner who draws down glucose stored in her muscles. Oh God, do you hear this? Do you hear my life? She's saying that, like. The effect is analogous. I'm gonna say analogous. Analogous, analogous. You guys pick the word, I don't care. To a runner who draws down glucose stored in her muscles during a sprint. The bold implication of this idea is that the effects of ego depletion could be undone by ingesting glucose. And Baumeister and his colleagues have confirmed this hypothesis in the several experiments. Volunteers in one of their studies watched a short silent film of a woman being interviewed and were asked to interpret her body language. While they were performing the task, a series of words crossed the screen in slow succession. The participants were specifically instructed to ignore the words. And if they found their attention drawn away, they had to refocus their concentration on the woman's behavior. The act of self-control was known to cause ego depletion. All the volunteers drank some lemonade before participating in a second task. The lemonade was sweetened with glucose for half of them and the splendor for the others. They all the all, then all participants were given a task in which they needed to overcome an intuitive response to get the corrective answer. Intuitive errors are normally much more frequent among ego depleted people and the drinkers of Splendor showed that the expected depletion effect. On the other hand, the glucose drinkers were not depleted, restoring the level of available sugar in the brain and prevented the deterioration of performance. So that's a good key guys. If you're doing a test, eat sugar, but don't get diabetes because that's bad. Uh, <laughs> it will take some time and much further research to establish whether the task that caused glucose depletion also caused the mom momentary arousal that is reflected in the increase of pupil size and heart rate. A disturbing demonstration of de depletion effects and judgment was recently reported in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. The unwitting participants in the study were eight parole judges in Israel. They spent entire days reviewing applications for parole, the cases are presented in random order and the judges spend little time on each one, an average of six minutes. The default decision is denial of parole. Only 35% of requests are approved. The exact time of each decision is recorded in the times of the judges' three food breaks, uh, morning break, lunch and afternoon break. During the day are recorded as well. The authors of the study plotted the proportion of approved requests against the time since the last food break the proportion spikes after each meal when about 65% of requests are granted during the two hours or so until the judge's next feeding. The approval rate drops steadily to about zero just before the meal, as you might expect. This is an unwelcome result and the authors carefully checked many alternative, many alternative explanations. The best possible account of the data provides bad news. Tired and hungry judges tend to fall back on the easier default position of denying requests for parole. Both fatigue and hunger probably play a role. The lazy system two. One, on, one of the main functions of system two is to monitor uh, and control thoughts and actions suggested by system one, allowing some to be expressed directly in behavior and suppressing or modifying others. For example, here is a simple puzzle. Do not try to solve it, but Listen to your intuition. 
A bat and ball cost $1.10. The bat cost $1 more than the ball. The bat cost, and how much does the ball cost? One dollar. So uh, I'm guessing it cost one dollar, right? Or ten cents. Okay. Yeah, I said I said dollar. Okay. The number came up. The number of course. Oh, I said the dollar, but it says the number of course is ten ten cents. The distinctive mark of this easy puzzle is works and answer that is intuitive, appealing, and wrong. Do the math, and you'll see if the ball costs ten cents, the total cost will be dollar twenty. Wow, I'm stupid. Okay, yeah, I'm really stupid. Okay, no, no, I'm gonna do that again. I'm not cutting it. I'm just gonna do it again. So, a bad and ball cost for dollar ten. I said the worst answer possible. <laughs> Jesus, I was trying to be smart. I was like, let me see. Uh, bad and ball. That that multiplication thing now is just gone, and that I did the other video. I mean, or now, whatever. A bad and ball cost dollar ten. The bad cost one dollar more than the ball. So. I was thinking the ball cost 10 cents, but it's not. So I don't know how the frick. A number can't, the number cost 10 cents. The distinctive mark of the easy puzzle is that it works and answer that is intuitive, appealing and wrong. Do the math and you'll see if the ball cost 10 cents, then the total cost will be a dollar 20. Yeah, 10 cents for the ball and $1, $10 for the bat. Not $1.10. Correct answer is five cents. What the fuck? Okay. Uh, it is safe to assume that the intuitive answer also came to mind of those who ended up with the correct number. They somehow managed to re resist the intuition. Shane, Frederick, and I worked together on the theory. I just want to... So I'm guessing the correct answer is five cents. Whatever, dude. That's math. I don't know how they got that. A bat and a ball cost one dollar and ten cents. The bat cost one dollar more than the ball. How much did the ball cost? The bat cost one dollar more than the ball. So one. So yeah, it's five cents. Okay, I get it. So, but how the hell am I supposed to put divided by two? No, I don't freaking know, dude. This is weird. I don't know, dude, whatever. This is just, someone put in the comments, you dumbass, uh, this is how you do it. <sighs> okay, Shane, Frederick, and I worked together in theory of judgment based on two systems and used the bat and ball puzzle to study a central question. How closely does system two monitor the suggestion of system one? His reasoning was that we know a significant fact about anyone who says the ball cost $10. The person did not actively check whether the answer was correct. And if system to endorse an intuitive answer that would have rejected with a small investment of effort. Furthermore, we also know that the people who give the intuitive answer have missed an obvious social cue. They should have wondered why anyone would include in the question and may have puzzled with such an obvious answer. A failure to check is remarkable because of the cost of checking is so low. A few seconds of mental work, the problem is moderately difficult, the slightly tensed muscle and dilated pupils could avoid an embarrassing mistake. Well, I've just completely embarrassed myself, guys. Enjoy that for your entertainment. People who say 10 cents appear to be ardent followers of the law of least effort. People who avoid that answer appear to have more active minds. Okay. Many thousands of university students have answered that the bad and poor puzzle on the results are shocking. More than 50% of students at Harvard, MIT, and Princeton give the intuitive incorrect answer. I am redeemed. Uh, at less, at less selective university, the rate of demonstrate demonstrate demonstrable 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 I don't know demonstrable failure demonstrable failure. There, I got it. To check was in excess of eighty percent. I'm just gonna keep on going. So, oh god, so. As we found out that 50% of Harvard students are stupid, that's great. Wink. Okay. At less ex <laughs> no, it's not true. At less selective universities, the rate of demand I can't even say demonstrable, demonstrable. 
Demon, 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 Put that on the phone. Give me a second. Demonstrable. Demonstrable. Say again. Demonstrable. Demonstrable. Don't fucking mumble, you bitch. Demonstrable. 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 Ah, uh, uh -huh. demonstrable. I said. De I thought it said like a demonstration. <laughs> I'm stupid, man. The rate of demonstrable failure to check was in excess of 80%. The bat and ball problem is our first encounter with an observation that will be a recurring theme of this book. Many people are overconfident and prone to place too much faith in their intuitions. They apparently find cognitive effort at least mildly unpleasant and, uh, and avoid it as much as possible. Now, I will show you a logical argument, two premises a and a conclusion. Try to determine as quickly as you can if the argument is logically valid. Does the conclusion follow from the premises? All roses are flowers. Some flowers fade quickly, therefore some roses fade quickly. All roses are flowers. Some flowers fade quickly, therefore some roses fade quickly. No, that's untrue. How do you know? You said some flowers fade quickly, therefore it can. A large majority of college students endorse this slow. Oh, so this is a freaking word again. Syllogism. I'm gonna say syllogism. It's a syllogism as valid. Syllogism. 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 Wow, that's embarrassing. Syllogism. Syllogism as valid. In fact, the argument is flawed because it is possible that there are no roses among the flower that fade quickly. That there are no roses among the flowers that fade quickly. Just as in the bad and ball problem, a plausible answer comes to mind immediately. Overriding requires hard work. The insistent idea that it is true, it is true, makes it difficult to check the logic, and most people do not take the trouble to think through the problem. This is experiment has discouraging implications for reasoning in everyday life. It suggests that when people believe in a conclusion is true, they are also very likely to believe arg arguments that appear to support it, even when these arguments are unsound. If system one is involved, the conclusion comes first and the arguments follow. Next, consider the following questions and answer it quickly before read reading on. How many murders occur in the state of Michigan and why? The final part of mine. The question, which was also devised by Shane Frederick, is again challenged to system two. The trick is whether the respondent will remember that Detroit, a high crime city, is in Michigan. Wow, I'm a, I didn't know. I, I don't live in Michigan. College, college students in the United States know this fact and correctly identified Detroit as the largest city in Michigan. But knowledge of a fact is not all or none. Facts that we know do not always come to mind when we need them. People who remember that Detroit is in Michigan give higher estimates of the murder rate in the state than people who do not. But a majority of Frederick respondents did not think of the city when questioned about the state. Indeed, the average guess by people who were asked about Michigan is lower than the guesses of similar group who were asked about the murder rate in Detroit. Blame for a failure to think of Detroit can be laid on both system and system system one. Well, here's an idea. Who the fuck knows what the murder rate is in fucking Michigan and Detroit? I fucking surely do not. I don't look it up. I go, hey, I got my earphone. Uh, who's dying today in Michigan? Huh? Wow. More like 10,000, 20,000 people that say that. The murder rate. Maybe 100,000, depending on what's going on. Whether the city comes to mind when the state is mentioned depends on part of the automatic function of memory. People differ in this respect. The representation of the state of Michigan is very detailed in some people's minds. Residents of the state are more likely to retrieve many facts about it than people who live elsewhere. Geography buffs will retrieve more than others who specialize in baseball statistics. More intelligent individuals are more likely than the others to have rich representations of most things. <clears throat> Intelligence is not only the ability to reason, it's also the ability to find relevant material in memory and to deploy attention when needed. Memory function is an attribute of System 1. However, everyone has the option of slowing down to conduct an active search of memory for all possi 
possibly relevant facts, just as they could slow it down to check the intuitive answer in the bat and ball problem. The extent of deliberate checking and search is a characteristic of system two, which varies among individuals. The bat and ball problem, <clears throat> the flower sly, sly, I don't know, syllogism, and the Michigan Detroit problems have something in common. Failing these mini tests appears to be at least to to some extent a matter of insufficient motivation, not trying hard enough. Anyone who could and can be admitted to a good university is certainly able to resume. Uh, anyway, anyone who can be admitted to a good university is certainly able to reason through the first two questions and to reflect about Michigan long enough to remember the major city in the state and its crime problem. These students can solve much more difficult problems when they are not tempted to accept a superficially plausible answer that comes readily to mind. The ease with which they are satisfied enough to start thinking is rather troubling. Lazy is a harsh judgment about the self-monitoring of these young people on this system too, but it does not seem to be unfair. Those who avoid the sin of intellectual sloth that could be called engaged, they are more alert, more in intellect intellectually active, less willing to be satisfied with superficially attractive ones, more skeptical about their intuitions. The psychologist Keith Stanovic uh, would call them more rational. Intelligence control rationality. Researchers have applied diverse methods to examine the connection between thinking and self-control. Some have addressed it by asking correlation question. If people were ranked by their self-control and by their cognitive aptitude, would individuals have similar positions in the two rankings? In one of the most famous experiments in the history of psychology, Walter Miskell and his students exposed four-year children to a cruel dilemma. They were given a choice between a small reward, one aurea, which they could have any time or a larger reward, two cookies for which they had to wait 15 minutes under difficult conditions. They were to remain alone in a room facing a desk with two objects, a single cookie and a bell that the child could ring at any time to call in the experiment and receive the one cookie. As the experiment was described, there were no toys, book, book, no toys, book, pictures, or sorry, books, pictures, or other potentially distracting items in the room. The experimenter left the room and did not return until 15 minutes had passed, or the child had rung the bell, eaten the reward, stood up, or shown any signs of distress. The children were watched through a one-way mirror, and the film that shows that their behavior during the waiting time always has the audience roaring laughter. About half the children managed the feat of waiting for 15 minutes, mainly by keeping their attention away from tempting reward. 10 or 15 years later, a large gap had opened between those who had resisted temptation and those who had not. The resistors had higher measures of executive control in cognitive tasks and especially the ability to relocate their attention effectively. As young adults, they were less likely to take drugs. A significant difference in intellectual aptitude emerged. The children who had shown more self-control as four-year-olds had substantially higher scores on tests of intelligence. So the higher self-control, the more high intelligence. That's an interesting thing. A team of researchers at University of Oregon explored the link between cognitive control and intelligence in several ways, including an attempt to raise intelligence by improving the control of attention. During five 40-minute sessions, they exposed children aged four to six to various computer games especially designed to demand attention and control. In one of the exercises, the children used a joystick to track a cartoon cat and move it to a grassy area while avoiding a muddy area. The grassy areas gradually shrank and the muddy area expanded, requiring progressively more precise control. The testers found that training attention not only approved executive control, scores on non-verbal tests of intelligence also improved and the improvement was maintained for several months. Other research by the same group identified specific genes that are involved in the control of attention showed that parenting techniques also affected this ability and demonstrate a close connection between the children's ability to control their attention and the ability to control their emotions. Shane Frederick constructed a cognitive ref reflection test which consists of the bat and ball problem and two other questions chose, uh, sorry, and two other questions chosen because they also invite an intuitive answer that is both compelling and wrong. The on the question the question are shown in chapter five. The questions are shown in chapter five. He went on the study Characteristics of students who score very low in the test, the supervisory function of system two is a weak in these people, and found that they're prone to answer questions with the first idea that comes to mind and are willing to invest the effort needed to check their intuitions. Individuals who uncritically follow their intuitions about puzzles are also prone to accept other suggestions from system one. In particular, they are impulsive, impatient, and keen to receive immediate gratification. For example, 
63% of the intuitive resp respondents say they would prefer to get $3,400 this month rather than $3,800 next month. Only 37% of those who solve all three puzzles correctly have the same short-sighted preference for receiving a small amount immediately. When asked how much they will pay to get overnight delivery of a book they have ordered, the low scores on the cognitive reflection test are willing to pay twice as much as the high scores. As the high scores. Uh, Frederick's findings suggest that the characters of our psychodrama have different personalities. System 1 is impulsive and intuitive. System 2 is capable of reasoning and it's, it's cautious, but at least for some people, it is also lazy. We recognize related differences among individuals. Some people are more like the system two, others are closer to the system one. This simple test has emerged as one of the better predictors of lazy thinking. <clears throat> Keith Stanovich and his longtime collaborator, Richard West, originally introduced this term system one and system two. They now prefer to speak of type one and type two processes. Stanovich <clears throat> and his colleagues have spent De decades studying difference among the individuals and the kind of sorry, let me do that. Uh, and his colleagues have spent de decades studying differences among individuals and the kinds of problems with which the book is concerned. They have asked one basic question in many different ways: What makes some people more susceptible <clears throat> than others to biases of judgment? Stanovich published his conclusions in the book titled "Rationality and the Ref Reflective Mind." which offers a bold and distinctive approach to the topic of this chapter. He draws a sharp distinction between two parts of system two. Indeed, this distinction is so sharp that he calls them separate minds. One of these minds, he calls it algorith algorithmic, deals with slow thinking and demanding quick computation. Some people are better than others in these tasks of brain power. They are the individuals who excel intelligent tests and are able to switch from one task to another quickly and efficiently. However, Stanovich argues that high intelligence does not make people immune to biases. Another ability is involved, which he labeled rationality. Stanovich's concept of rational person is similar to what I earlier labeled engaged. The core of his argument is that rationality should be distinguished from intelligence. In his view, superficial or lazy thinking is a flaw in the reflective mind, a failure of rationality. This is an attractive and thought-provoking idea. In support of it, Stanovich and his colleagues have found that the bad and bull question and others like it are somewhat better indicators of susceptibility to cognitive errors than are conventional measures of intelligence such as IQ tests. Time will tell whether the distinction between intelligence and rationality can lead to new discoveries. That is really interesting. <clears throat> Speaking of control, she did not have to struggle to stay on task for hours. She was in a state of flow. His ego was depleted of after a long day of meetings, so he just turned to standard operating procedures instead of thinking through the problem. He didn't bother to check whether what he said made sense. Does he usually have a lazy system too, or was he unusually tired? Unfortunately, she tends to say the first thing that comes into her mind. She probably also has trouble delaying gratification. Weak system too. That is the end of chapter three. Put your thoughts and ideas in the comments below. Maybe comment on how terrible I am <laughs> and how shit I am reading sometimes. But sometimes you don't know the word. Anyway, thanks for watching. I'm probably going to edit some of the stuff out because weak systems. <laughs> uh, but yeah, thanks. Uh, what I mean by weak systems is that people interrupt. Thanks. Like and subscribe, guys. Cheers. Bye.